Bonjour tout le monde. I am Janet Sungpo Mills. There is no other place on this planet to learn than Springboard Your Virtual University. Hello and welcome to Springboard Your Virtual University. My name is Albert Okran. Welcoming you on behalf of Team Springboard, led by Comfort. This is your most inspirational show and the point of convergence for the greatest minds. Springboard is brought to you by the Springboard Roadshow Foundation in partnership with the Multimedia Group and proudly sponsored by MTN Pulse, the enterprise group UMB Bank with support from the graphic business. And that's an invitation to look into page 18 of the graphic business for a full transcript of our interview coming up today. So we've been traveling this journey inside the engine room for the past 10 editions. And the mission is simple. We get behind the scenes with frontliners to find out the what, the why, the whom, the how, the which, the tough calls, the difficult decisions that undergird their journey. What you wouldn't find in any magazine or book. So far, we've had Diana Hamilton, Israel Laye, we've had Ajiti Annan, Anita Eskin, Kwame Eugene, Father Campbell, Gifty Auntie, Doreen Ando, Rashid Anasamu, and we had last week Janet Sunkwa Mills. Today I bring on a Springboard legend. Anyone who's traveled more than five cities in Springboard is a legend, and this one has done all of them. He's a professional master of ceremonies, he's a corporate trainer, he's an author, he's a family man, he's a lecturer, and most importantly, he's a big friend of Springboard. Kafui Day, good to see you again. Good to see you, Albert. Glad to be here. And I was wondering whether you're looking into a teleprompter because your introduction was just on point. I was just listening with the broadcaster's ears, you know, and I, I loved it. You know, you, <laughs> you are just always, <laughs> this is just you. <laughs> no, no, I loved it. I loved it. It was just natural. And it was like you were reading the script, you know, but it was all in the teleprompter of your mind, I guess. So... You see it there, you know, it's at some point, yeah, delivering 100% all the time. Just, just yeah. to start us off, <laughs> when, are you, when are you at your best? What, what, what is it that when you are doing, you feel this is coffee day? It's TV. TV. It's TV. It's morning TV. It's interviewing people, getting into the minds of people. My all-time hero in broadcasting has to be the legend, Larry King. Ah, talking about, <laughs> talking about Larry King, you've done, you've done his book. Oh, yes. I'm sure you've read, you've read that book so I've, many times. Listen to the audio, it. you can tell the beginning to the I've end. I've read that book. Uh, the, the audio is on YouTube. Uh, I've read that book. I'm reading another one of his books. I, my favorite part of Larry King's biography is the first show on TV and that disastrous effort that had his producer literally yelled into his ears and said, do something. And Communicate, come on. Talk, come on. Yes, and he just went on and he was just honest about this is my first time on the air. They just gave me a name. I'm saying this name for the very first time because the, the producer gave him the name literally five minutes before he before went on show. air. It was Larry Zegis, correct? Yes, yes. They said they can't pronounce that name. They found a name for him from a newspaper. Yes, you are Larry King. Go on and, <laughs> and produce. And he did 60,000 interviews. He was interviewing two years before he died. At the age of 85, 86, he was still interviewing. He was just awesome. What about him do you like? His philosophy. He says he does not say I in his interviews because the interview is not about him. So he will ask questions that allow the guests to just flourish. And he asks very simple questions. What happened? What surprised you? What happened? I mean, those were his, his questions. And he asked questions that you would love to ask. He gave a typical, typical example of he had an, an, an airline pilot in front of him. And he asked the pilot, when you are taxiing down the runway, the plane is gathering speed. Do you think the plane will not rise at the end of the, of the runway? And the pilot said, that's a, a really good question, you know. Well, by the laws of physics, the plane will rise, but staying up. He cannot control that. It could be a bad strike, an engine could fail, but he knows the plane will rise. <laughs> and he said he had never been asked that question before. You know? So I love Larry King for the questions he asks. Very simple questions, almost like an ignorant person, and always curious. He's my hero. Talking about planes landing, I recall our experience on our travels, you and I, in comfort on Springboard, 
you you being uh, official MC for one of the years, the, and the number of years that you did it, but mm -hmm. one of the years, and we talking about the old time pilots and how they landed the oh. plane, oh. and we having the privilege of being flown by Captain Mills Lamptey, Fantastic. and debating how he would land the plane, and oh. they would clap, and, and oh. just watching him do his craft, and going to ask him about the art and craft of landing planes. Exactly. remember that one? I do remember vividly. He says, listen, you have to treat the bird, the plane with respect, and land the plane Gently, and it was a competition, internal, internal competition uh, amongst the Ghana Airways pilots who will land this plane softly. I mean, gently respect the equipment, and it's all it's it's excellence. It's doing the best every time, and I'm sure they enjoyed getting that round of applause when they yeah, landed the plane. It, it was almost a tradition. It was wonderful. The Ghana Airways pilots were just they represented excellence at the highest level. You know, I, I, I'm told that a measure of a good landing was if a, 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 a client or a, a passenger remained asleep after you landed. Yes, yes. And it happened a lot on Ghana Airways oh, planes. Yes. He said often people would be asleep, the plane would land, they wouldn't know the plane, they would only be woken up by the applause. So it's the applause that woke them up. And they would say, what happened? And then they actually start clapping <laughs> We've themselves. Landed. <laughs> We've landed. Oh, good, 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 good. So, I mean, that was excellence. And, that, and you think the, the key word from that is excellence? Attention to detail. Customer service, excellence. Let's go back to your beginnings. When did you discover this talent in communication? Because that's a common thread that runs through everything you do. As an author, you've written about how to become an MC. So your, your, even your writing is about communication. As a lecturer, you are lecturing in journalism mm -hmm. communication. As an MC, you are communicating. As a broadcaster, you are communicating. Indeed. When did you discover this talent? I did not know I would be a TV presenter. All I do know is that from as young as I can remember, though we were surrounded by books. It was books and music in our home. My father always made sure we had a piano wherever we lived, wherever we lived in Ghana or around the world. But it was the love of books. So we had the World Book Encyclopedia, which we could just pick up. You just pick a letter, J, uh, pick a page, 45, and just start reading. So it's always books. And we had these exercises we had to do, my brothers and I, we were supposed to deliver 10 words a day to our old man. Every day, Christmas day, he wants his 10 words. Easter, 10 words. Sunday, 10 words. There was no break. So he would come back from work and he would say, okay, Senna, big brother, what are your 10 words? So Senna is supposed to, and all of us, not just Senna, you're supposed to identify, you have your exercise book with your 10 words, the phonetic transcription of the word, the meaning of the word, and you put the word in a sentence. This was without fail. There was no excuse at all. And his calculation was simple. He says, listen, if you learn 10 words a day, in a week you learn 70 words. In a month you learn 300 words. In a year you learn over 3,000 words. In three years you know more words than your English teacher. It's exactly the same philosophy that our mutual friend Nido Kuben used to learn English language when he flew in from Jordan to America with absolutely no knowledge of the language, with an aspiration to become the favorite public speaker in America. That's it. And that's how he achieved it. That's it. Ten words a day. And you say, add the phonetic. Yes, transcription. transcription. Yes. yes, indeed. The meaning. The meaning. And, and put, put it, it in, a, in sentence. a sentence. So you're not just learning words and stuffing your head with words. You have to know how to use the words. This was randomly. Anytime he met you, then. then yes, he came, he came back from work. We took off his socks. Back in the day, we used to take off our dad's socks. We didn't enjoy the experience, but we didn't let him know. <laughs> and then he, we would have to deliver the words. You, you, there was no excuse. No. So that's something that has lived with me also. There are no excuses. Do you do the same to your children? Yes. In the same way? So not in the same way. So, so it's, it's, we've, we've remixed it now. I remember there was a time my, my boys, I have three sons, their teacher was complaining about their, their, their handwriting. I don't know whether it's a 21st century thing, but they said, your handwriting, your handwriting is, is, is not exciting. We can't read. We need a first copy book. 
And I went and looked at the first copy book. The, the sentences were not that inspiring for me. So I thought, you know what? Let me buy them some books that they can read and also copy um, the passages out of. So I gave one a book on Nkrumah, a, one a book on Agri, and then another one a book on, on Mandela, the eldest one. And their exercise was every day, just write out a paragraph or two of whatever you are reading. But I should be able to read it. So they were doing that regularly. And then Mandela died. We were watching the news on CNN, and then a guy comes up, and my eldest son says, I know that man. I said, where do you know him from? So, well, he's Ahmed Kathrada. He spent some time in Robben Island with Mandela. I said, how do you know this? So, well, the book you gave me to, <laughs> to be writing out my, my, my practice my handwriting, and then immediately I knew that this is exactly what I wanted to write. Because I wanted them not just to learn how to write clearly, but also imbibe something useful, which they wouldn't get from just, uh, Amma is a boy. Uh, Amma is a, is a sister to Kofi in first copy book. They were actually imbibing that knowledge and improving their handwriting as well. I was so impressed. So the other guys also were telling me snippets about Agri, uh, Nkrumah, and they were also improving their handwriting. So it, that was my contribution to remixing what my father taught us to get knowledge um, on a daily basis to improve yourself because these are tools. Words are tools. Talking about remixing, if you wanted to take our education system and tear it apart and re put it together, what would be the key components you add? Make the education more practical. Let's have more projects because in the real world, we learn from one another. The copy, copy that they punish you with in the old school is something that you actually do in the real world. You, you work with people, you find out what, you're, what, what works here, and you, you collaborate. You come together and you do the work uh, for the common uh, good. And you make the, the, the lessons interesting so that people don't actually feel that they're in school, but they're learning something which is organic. At GIJ, where I teach a course, a new course called Journalism and the Arts, I always start a, a class by putting a word up on the blackboard, and I think this is a shout out to my dad, and I ask people to give me synonyms of this particular word. So if we are looking at cultural journalism, I put the words up, culture and journalism. On the board, and then we do like a mind map. What are the synonyms? 10 different words for cultural, and you put it there. 10 different words for journalism. And then you are getting associations, reporting. Uh, one of the things I learned um, on the core program, working with MasterCard Foundation, yeah. was about engagement, yes. especially with young people. and not just engaging with them from the patronizing point of view, but actually working with them in the design, the rollout, the execution, the implementation, the evaluation of programs that concern them because they are the ones. They are the ones. And you are saying that you make people feel a part of this. Because that's how stuff works these days. On television, if I know I'm speaking to um, a particular topic, I asked a question on Twitter or Facebook the, day, the night before. What do you think about the death penalty? Then people give you their, 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 their ideas, and you can use, actually use that to make your show rich. And they also watch because they feel that they have an input in the show. It's called co-creation. Guess what? And that's a big word, MasterCard, co-creation. Yes. Do you know that some of the questions I'm asking you are questions people ask me to ask you? Thank you. I'm not surprised at all because that's how. If I wanted to interview you, I would not do a single bit of research, or no. I'll do a little bit. I'll just ask people what what one question would you ask Albert Okra if you had the chance? Yes, and then I'll go to your tweets and your Facebook and just read stuff that you put out. This is how I prepared for. And I get pleasantly surprised yes. at the quality and the depth of questions I'm put asking. Th th things you would never have thought about. I interviewed KSM like that once, and my entire research was just going through his tweets. And so I said, oh, look, on this day, you said this and this. What did you mean? And he says, uh, uh, how did you get this? Well, uh, you put it out yourself, KSM. <laughs> you know? and, 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 and it's just, it's just so co-creation is, is a big thing. I would wish that our educational curriculum would be based around that kind of philosophy so that people feel that they are part of it. And it's not just you receiving from the mountaintop and going to chew, pa, pass, poor, to poor pass and forget, we've gone beyond that now. Let's go to your professional journey. Let's mm -hmm. look at not just the successes, but also the pains, yeah. the disappointments, the True. regrets. The, the, because one of the things that we want this show to do is to not just admire your achievements, mm -hmm. but also relate to your failures. Indeed. So give me an idea about your professional journey, the climbings and then the descents as well. So for 17 years, I was a salesman. When I graduated from University of Ghana, and then I did my national service at the French department, I started out by climbing roofs. 
<laughs> because I was a roof salesman, so you have to go inspect the roofs, find out where the holes are, and then propose a solution. So I learned how to do proposal writing. I learned how to, to use a, a computer for the very first time in 1995. Yeah. And I remember once, I've climbed every tall building in Accra. I can say post office, Golden Tulip. One day I was on top of Golden Tulip and I was thinking, hey, so imagine Mrs. Day, my mom is going to Accra from the Adenta. She looks up and she sees her, her, son. her beloved second son on top of a roof. Would she not have a, an asthma attack? <laughs> You know, so I did that. I did various bits of sales. I was in shipping. I was in 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 in, in logistics. I was in in uh, ship brokering. Uh, I did a bit of broadcast media marketing at Choice FM, and then TV just opened up a door to me. I saw an ad in the paper, Business and Financial Times. They were looking for a TV host for a game show, and I thought, hey, I can do this. All I had was radio experience from University of Ghana when they started out there. The radio station, SRC Radio, which became Voice of Legon, which became Universe. I think Universe has produced quite a number of good journalists. They are a real factory. Bernard of Le Oh, yes, Bernard is there. Oh, yes. And quite a number of Quite a few of them. So many people. So many. So, so that was my experience. And I thought, well, TV is just uh, radio with pictures. <laughs> Didn't know. So I, I, I applied. But before that, TV3 came to town and I went for an audition and I failed. So yeah, shout outs to those who failed me because you, I did. Where this? I don't know who failed me, but they said you're not good enough. And uh, well, I took it. I have this habit of when I'm going to do something big, I don't tell the whole world, so that if it fails, I can lick my wounds in private. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It makes sense. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, don't broadcast it. You want to have done it and then say you've done it. Nobody cares about, I'm about to. And that was a lesson from my father as well. He says, I don't want to hear you say, I'm about to, I was going to do this, but this happened. You've either done it or you have not done it. He was a very binary guy. You've either done it or you haven't done it. Have you washed the car? He wants to hear yes or no. If it's no, what are you doing to make sure that the car is washed? Okay. So fast forward to Who Wants to Be Rich? I did the interview. I prepared a lot. So auditions, don't joke with them. I did the research on YouTube. I checked out every single show I could follow. The show in, 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 in Nigeria, the show in, in New Zealand, in Australia, in the UK, in America. I looked at how they were clothed. How do they look? What's their demeanor? How do they get on the stage? And I modeled. So you see, in school they say copying is not allowed. But in the real world, if you want to succeed, you need to copy from the best. Okay. So I just, I just modeled and I went to the audition. And we were over 40 people. After the first round, we were pruned down to three. And then two, and then we did a, a pilot, and I was the one picked for the job. Years after, I asked the producers, why did you choose me and not the other guy? They said, well, you are both equally talented. You both aced the pilot, but the game changer was we asked the crew of these two guys, who would you love to work with? And I understand that I wasn't there, you and I were not there, but I understand I won the vote. And then and I asked, why do you think, why did they say I won the vote? They said, well, you were quite interested in what they were doing. So you come, you, I would go to the camera guy and ask him, listen, how long have you been doing this job? Uh, what is this lens for? I'll talk to the sound guy. I'll talk to the makeup person, you know, as they're making my face. We're, we're chatting and I'm curious. And people like to be talked to. And they like the curiosity thing. In, so. my, in my opinion, <laughs> that, without even bothering to ask you, is your greatest asset as a human being. I mean, I've said this on the highest platforms in the world. I actually mentioned your name, and I said it on the, the last big convocation at the National Theater of Springboard with all the, uh, the whole world listening, that there's something that I've learned from you that I think is absolutely magical, and that is that ability to connect with every single person patiently, attentively, and very interested. And I, I got that the first time it really struck me. I've seen it several times, and even before you walked in here. But the day it really struck me was Tamale Market. I will never forget. We were literally running from our hotel to Fila FM for an interview. <laughs> I thought we were late. It was a 2 p.m. interview. We needed to get there, talk about the show that night. We were just literally running through the town. And then people will stop you and say, who wants to be rich? And you will still stop and say hello to them and ask them their name. 
what do they do? I'm like, Charlie, you, you, what? <laughs> we can interview. you. We have we to you. <laughs> it, it was almost natural. Do you? Does it come naturally to you to be that interested in people? I learned this from my parents. So my, my, my father and my mother were people, people. My father was a more laid back people person. My mother was more gregarious, more outgoing. But they did not discriminate with whoever they met. I met, I will never forget this. So I have a, a Rastafarian friend who came to visit our home for the very first time in Adenta. He knocks on the door. My father says, come in. My father is sitting watching TV. And the Rastafarian guy does a double take. He's not sure whether he should enter. My father says, no, no, come inside, sit down. Who are you looking for? He said, it was, it's cafe. I was inside the room, so it took me about 10 minutes. Came out, and my father was having a big chat with my Rasta friend about music and all kinds of things, philosophy, Marcus Gavi. So we excuse ourselves, we go, and he says, ah, Johnny, this be the first time where I go somewhere where people accept me. And no questions, no suspicions, who are you, what are you doing here? I said, well, my dad is that kind of person. He treats everybody as human beings. You know, and that's one thing I learned. My mom too was like that. So I think it's by osmosis. And my brothers are like that too, so <laughs> it's by osmosis. Yeah, we learned it from home. Yeah. A beautiful lesson, and, I, and I've, I've taught it in seminars, I've taught it in courses, and I think that it's a skill and a practice that you, 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 I mean, if nobody has told you, it's one of the biggest lessons I've learned from you as a friend and a brother. People love to talk about themselves. And people love to be Why? Because that's the person you know most. And people, people are dying to show you what they've done. I mean, just a simple question. I just asked the makeup artist, how many faces have you done? How many faces do you do a day? She says, oh, and she laughed out. And then they started counting. And I asked, what's the most, your, the most difficult face? What's a difficult face for you to do? And they had given me makeup secrets. These are things that I can file away and use later on. You know, people just like to be interested in. They want people to... They want, they want to talk. Everybody wants to talk. It's not just TV people or radio people. Everybody want, has something. They, they, everybody has a story. And for lack of someone asking you, you may not tell your story. And it doesn't have to be some fantastic, I built a company and um, uh, $2 billion or whatever. I, 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 I employ 10,000 people. They don't want to tell you about their day, man. And, and, and I learned that from Larry King as well. He could ask, what surprised you? Three, a three-word question. Yeah. And people will talk. What do you fear most? And he keeps quiet. And he listens to you. <laughs> and then he just follows up. That's all. So, so I'm, I'm absorbing that. And I, I, I like David Ampofoto. He's another one of my heroes as well. And I, I suspect that he's also a fan of Larry King because he asks questions like him as well. And I think he's just another excellent journalist as well. So, yeah, combination of heroes and upbringing and my own curiosity. I'm very curious. Have you been crushed before? On the professional journey, have you been crushed? Before? Oh, yes. Tell us about it. When I left uh, my last job, two days after, some online stories started going around that, in fact, the man didn't, um, he didn't resign or his contract didn't end and he didn't renew it. Um, there was some sexual harassment issues against him. Really? Yes. This was a huge thing that was, and this was around the Me Too 2018. So I just thought, you know what, it's just some of these people, bloggers, you know, cheap data, half-baked education. He wants to make some money for his site. Ignore him. Then the thing starts building, building, building. Then I start getting calls from people abroad. It's actually, I've seen this story somewhere. And I'm thinking, oh, what's going on? And then now I, I call my, one of my lawyer friends and say, listen, something is going around here. I, I think we need to stop this, uh, what's going on. So he says, well, if we can find the people, we will send them um, a cease and desist before you escalate. You couldn't find any address to the website. Uh, nothing was going on. Then I, I thought, you know what, it's time to just tell my wife that this is happening before she's surprised by anything nasty, which is not true. So I go to her and say, listen. Was it a dawn? This wasn't dawn. This was like... In the in the afternoon, it's just we're relaxed, and I said, you know what? I need to tell you something about what's something that's going on online. So uh, I know already. In fact, one of my friends called and says, "But oh, we are with you in these trying times." Trying times. <laughs> <laughs> you can't believe this. So we couldn't find the people. We couldn't do a season disease. So I just went. I used my social media and I just crafted a a a a, a press release saying, "Let's." 
treat these uh, allegations and things with the contempt that they deserve. I put it on everything, my LinkedIn, my Facebook, my Twitter, my Instagram, everything, everything. And then some, I mean, our Deborah and others people picked it up. Guess what? Within two or three days, the, the website shuts down, never to come up again. They, they, I, it's just, just clickbait. These are the same people who wrote some very fantastic stories about uh, Reverend Otabo, which are totally false. And I just realized that this was just a, a spoof site, people just looking for. And that really, 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 it made me feel sad. But it also gave me a lesson to teach in my journalism classes about the power of um, negative journalism. So if you, don't, if, if you do not have the right um, value system, you just want to make money, and destroy somebody's reputation. Is because that what they call cyberbullying? Yes. And it's just, it's, it's just making money with clicks, you know? So, so that really disappointed me. I felt really disappointed. And the whole Me Too environment, I mean, we see what's happening now with my, uh, Cuomo, the, 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 the New York governor yeah. who's gone. Yeah. You know, these things can escalate, and then you have a stain on your reputation, and my reputation is the, all, it's the only thing I have. There's nothing else. You know? I'm, interested so, in, I'm interested in the conversation with your wife. Yes. How did it go? I mean, yes, she knew already. Yes. No, so I want, I, I, I want the details. Yeah, so, so, so I said... So how did you, how did you tell her? So I said, I said, Charlie, there's something I really want to tell you. Um, and it, it concerns some stuff that's going online, you know, and I just wanted to dismiss it. I'm just it imagining... Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, yeah I, said, so I wanted to dismiss it. But the thing is getting out of hand. I'm getting calls from people abroad and everything, you know, wondering what's going on, what's going on. He said, oh, um, I've heard it already, already. I've heard it already. I said, since when? Oh, it's for some time now. Oh, did some, she, did you see why she, she hadn't asked you? Uh, she didn't believe it. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. She, she, didn't believe, uh, she didn't believe it. And she said, oh, my friend even, one of my friends, so-called friends even said, oh, we're with you in these trying times, you know, <laughs> without any checking to see whether it was true or not, you know. Um, so, is it difficult to be a public figure? There are days that you, 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 you wish you could just walk around incognito. I did it once when I was at GH1. I got off my shift and I thought, let me just take a trotro to circle. I haven't done trotro in a long time. So I put on a hat, put on glasses, dark glasses, didn't say a word. Enjoyed my trotro ride, incognito, I thought. I got to the end of the, the, my trip and I thought, oh, well, let me just go back. From, circle, from GH1 to circle, it's just a straight route. So, Got on another truck draw, came back, uh, gave my money, but then now I had to open my mouth and they say, oh, uh, this, this. And the moment I opened my mouth, somebody said, you are the one. <laughs> <laughs> you should have given the exact amount without you. Oh, so you are the one. And then I said, Charlie, my experiment has failed. But I like it because Ghanaians are very interesting people. They recognize you, but they will chill just to see what kind of person you are, assess you, and then they'll come up and say, are, are you, you look very much like, oh, oh, this is the question I get all the time, uh, most of the time, are you the one I know? Then my question is, who do you know? Who is the one you know? <laughs> they say, oh, you are the one. I say, I, oh, 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 are you the one? You look very much like Kafu there. So I'm Kafu. No, you're not the one. You're, you're, you're too tall. The guy I know is short. For some reason, the TV is a liar because it, it reduces my height by like six inches. So really? Like, yeah, for some strange reason. I thought TV magnified people, but it reduces me. So when I come back from this break, <laughs> I'm going to talk about, about TV, <laughs> about aspects of Kafu's life that, but for this show, you would never, ever find out. My name is Albert Okran here with Kafri D inside the piston rings of the engine room, <laughs> drawing out stuff you will never find, including Trotro riding and the change that betrayed him. <laughs> Let's go for a break and say a big thank you to MTN Pulse, the Enterprise Group, UMB Bank, the Graphic Business, and the Multimedia Group. When we come back, let's unpack Kafri D like you've never seen it before. Please don't go away. Don't be left out. Download the Pulse app from the App Store or Play Store to mash up all day, every day. You can also enjoy more mashup. Just buy the new Mega Bundle and get 3 gigabytes data, extra 400 megabytes for your social apps, and free MTN to MTN calls every Monday. So go ahead, feel the Pulse on MTN Pulse. Just be we're good together. Everywhere you go.
There once was a man who had it all. He had skill. He had charisma. He was loved by all, but above all, he knew the importance of helping others, lifting others up. He knew the importance of giving other people an advantage, so that they too would use that advantage to help others. All you need is that advantage that sets you apart from the rest. And when you discover that advantage, life's challenges don't seem so daunting anymore. That's where we come in. Enterprise, your advantage. UMB was established in 1972 as the premier bank for the corporate and private sector in Ghana. From our very beginning, as the only Ghanaian bank serving all categories of businesses, we set a standard for excellence and innovation over the past 45 years. We've built a financially healthy and strong bank, demonstrated our commitment to our customers and to growing businesses, and exhibited originality and innovation at every turn. At UMB, our focus is built around people, service, products and technology. These are the key to our present success and our future triumphs. At UMB, we are poised to make a difference not only with our customers, but also in the banking industry. We invite you to share in our future. Our future starts now with you. Welcome back to Springboard, your virtual university in the engine room today with Kafui Day, my brother, over several years traveling across the country, exploring different cultures, different food, different experiences. We'll find out about a Springboard experience, but in the engine room today, so far, lessons one to six, the first about his hero, and he says Larry King is the model for him in broadcasting. Second one is about the power of words. He grew up with books and music and was required to do a 10-word challenge with his brothers every single day after removing their socks. And it's very important to mention that the 10-word challenge involved the phonetic transcription of the words, their meanings, and using them in sentences. And he says he has amended it for his children. They don't have to remove socks, but it's still 10 words. Third one is about education. He says make it more funky, make it more hip make it more exciting, use more projects and less chew and pour, and more co-creation. Number four is about research. He says research into the dressing, the demeanor, every single thing that you want to do, research well. And in real life, copying is allowed. Lesson number five is social skills. And he says treat people with respect, treat them with interest, show an interest in what they do, and people really want to talk about themselves, even if, they, even if they don't have a dramatic story. Number six is our favorite so far, the Trying Times edition of, <laughs> of, of Springboard. We talked about cyberbullying, <laughs> misconception, and a scandal created just for clicks and money. And that's the real world we are living in. Let's talk about your Springboard experience. I recall once traveling to Bulga, offering to fly you to Tamale, and then ride from Tamale one hour to Bulga, and you declined the plane ticket and drove in and out, and you experienced on the road. Talk about it, Kafi. I hadn't done, I hadn't gone to Northern Ghana before, so Springboard gave me the opportunity to do that. And I looked at uh, the distance and said, this is quite a, an epic journey, Marco Polo on, a, on some kind of level. So I said, you know what, let me break this journey. Let me try from Accra to Kumasi. So I did that. I used to work in Kumasi for years, but almost three years. So Accra Kumasi was my, my, my baby. So I did that, and then I slept, passed the night in Kumasi, and then did the drive from Kumasi to, to Tamale. What, Ghana is beautiful. What is the hashtag for the beautiful Ghana? My beautiful, my beautiful, my beautiful oh, Ghana. Ghana. Ghana is beautiful. I will not forget, never forget one stretch of the road where, I kid you not, I think for about maybe 10 kilometers, it's, it's as if it's a straight line. Somebody just drew a line from one point to the other and said, that's our road. And you're just going straight. And I was just imagining 300 years ago, there'll be lions in this savanna, you know, and monkeys and all kinds of interest. And it was just beautiful. 
I remember leaving Tamale after the springboard experience and I passed through a police checkpoint and the officer says, in my rear room, he says, stop, 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 stop. And so I stop. Then out of courtesy, I reverse. The officer looks at me. You are the guy! Wait, 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 wait. Then he goes into his, 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 his uh, little office and brings out yams and fills my booth with yams. A policeman? Policeman. Then you ask, is this that, time is the police, that, the police, is that, is that the police is giving, or, uh, uh, no, no, the motorist is not giving, the police, he just filled my car with yams, he said, take it away. And he asked you, is that, is that a financial? I said, this is my, I'm walking away, if I'm driving away with, with the yams. And he confirmed, is that a financial? He, he, he asked me, I said, yes, it is my final answer. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was just a wonderful experience. I mean, I love the Northern Ghana experience. I say the women there are empowered. You can't bluff a woman in Tamale with that, oh, I, I can't take it. She will jump on her own bike or her own motorbike and move. <laughs> you know? I just love that, that, that whole democracy and the empowerment of women. Uh, Sunyani, I loved it. It was, for me, Clean Sunyani and Ho are the cleanest yes, cities. I, 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 I vote the same. <laughs> Sunyani and Ho. I vote the same. No, 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 without a doubt. Beautiful, beautiful. You think, you think we should do more about domestic tourism? I think so. And, and the current minister is, is, is on a drive like that. I MC the launch of a domestic and regional tourism package and program, and they are pushing for us to go and visit. And I'm also one of the Visit Volta ambassadors. Ah, you know, you know I, I'm the only person from, <laughs> not from the Volta region, who has who volunteered no, to no, be no, no, an we, ambassador. We, I will tell them I have to send it you on every platform no, no, because. No, uh, my credentials will be shared with you. We're going to make Please it. Share the, no, 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 not, visit, share the credentials with me. Because I am telling you. You are on. I have been on for more than 10 years. My brother, you have experience. I know all the corners. Thank you. You are on. No, I mean, no doubt. I will tell them. Domestic <laughs> tourism is the key. It's, 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 it's it. No, it's, it's it. It's it. And we have to add value to it. I remember I, 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 I was, when I was working with a uh, travel company, I was taken to Amsterdam on a tour. The tour was nice, but I, I was annoyed for two reasons. We went to um, a, a jewelry shop. We entered. The first thing they said is, the best gold in the world is what we use to make our designer jewelry. Guess where the gold comes from? Ghana. Then we said Ghana. Then we, we did the tour. They showed us how everything was done. And the, sh the tour ended in a shop. In fact, you couldn't leave the establishment without passing through a shop. And I was thinking, this is great. You are forced to buy something. Yes. In the afternoon, we went to a confectionery, a chocolate place. The first words they said was, well, the best, the best chocolates, best chocolates are made from the best cocoa in the world. Where does it come from? Ghana. Then they showed us through the whole process of how the thing goes from cocoa to chocolates. We ended the shop, the tour, in, in a, a shop. shop. So you couldn't leave the establishment without passing through a shop to buy something. And I was thinking, we need this. I mean, I've been to the Kakum experience. I've done the Kakum experience. It was a frightening one. Um, I don't know how I survived that thing. And my wife had our third child inside, cooking inside her stomach. And I was wondering, why did I bring my wife and my two children here? <laughs> the, the unborn child was... Did you pray throughout the... the, the, the... Listen, at, at, at bridge three, I thought, let's go back. Listen, no, after that point, you can't go back. Yeah, just continue. I had the same experience. Here was I... And that wasn't even my first time. Here was I telling my daughter that in case you are, you are hot, I'll be there for you now. now. I promise to be there for you. Then we got to the middle... And I wanted to go back. I couldn't go back. It was even worse going back. And here was Nana encouraging me. Daddy, 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 go, 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 go. And then well, well, at some point they told us, oh, uh, by the, very casually, oh, they have elephants under there. I said, Lord, what am I doing here? <laughs> <laughs> elephants. We finished the bridge tour and I was expecting a t-shirt. Hey, I survived the Kakum experience. That would be something I can take. With or me, to, or go, or talk back, you crashing down pictures of when you were frightened, mm -hmm. videos of when you were frightened, being sold to you at 15 pounds. That we will buy the stuff. I survived Kakum yeah. alone. So we need to learn from all these things that we've seen in our travels and make domestic tourism great. I understand that the minister is working closely with the roads minister so that we can have access roads. Because the access roads to most of our I went to, places. I went to, I went to, to yes. earlier in the year. The, the access. access roads were good. But the amount that we paid was so low. Can maintain it. And I asked, is that all? Yeah. So. And the office, I looked at them. This amount for the whole tour, it's the whole too day. Low. It's too low. It's too low. With a tour guide. Yeah. Let's value. If the we put tip it, you gave them was more than five times the charge they gave you. Which should not be so. 
You know, yeah. so if we invest into it and make it a valuable experience, people will spend and you know, I've gotten something useful from this, and then they can, go, they can go and talk, they can hashtag it and talk about it, and then more people want to go. You know, so yeah, let's definitely. talk about a, a subject that we both like. We both are fans of phobia. Oh yes, and Man United is it's the best combination. You know, you so, live long. so if they if they if they, if they cut up cut open your you know you see two portions of red blood, then some yellow, and then some some blue. It's as simple as that. How big are you in sports? In school, I'm a vociferous supporter. And uh, vociferous, uh, very loud. I remember I was in a barber shop, and then uh, uh, on a show on, 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 on Joint News or so, one presenter said, vociferous. And then everybody in the barber shop said, nah, what's it there? What is, what is vociferous? <laughs> So I, I have to break it down for them. So he's, he's just very loud. Loud. Yes. So I think I'm a loud man you supporter since 84. So do the math. In school, I swam, not competitively. I swam because my father taught all of us how to swim. These days, I walk a lot every day. And I have a walk days. So I walk with my second son on Mondays, the first son on Wednesdays, and then the, the, the last son on Fridays is the days of their birth. So the Monday guy gets a Monday walk with me, the Wednesday guy gets a Wednesday walk with me, and the Friday guy gets a Friday walk with me. They are big on parenting. We have them just for a short while, and then they are released into the world. So we need to ground them uh, the right way so that when they go, they can stand on their feet. You know, Sometimes I look at them, and then I, I feel sad. I'm thinking, Charlie, one day I'll not be around to see them achieve all kinds of great things. And then you also think, but you are here now. So while you are here now, do all that you can to give them things that they will remember. I mean, I'm talking about my father, who's passed now. He's been passed since 2015. But things that he taught me, I, they're still with me. Things that my mom taught me. My father always said, listen, nothing is worth doing if it's not worth doing well. Ah, that's another thing you have in common. My grandfather had the <laughs> saying that was yes. very similar to yeah. that. And and whatever you do, do it well, because the thing we're doing is it's worth doing, doing well. well. And things done by halves are never done right. At and you all. say it all the time. You literally repeat it every day in your years. He was programming you. I think my father was programming. We, we couldn't understand him. The, the smallest thing as a thumbprint on a glass of water that you've, you've served him. He looks at the glass, puts it up to the light and says, take this glass away. I don't want to see your thumb brain on, my, on the glass. It's got to be clean. <laughs> Did he so, have a military background? My father nearly ended up in the army. So he was uh, the head of the cadets at Hachimota School. And the army wanted him to, to join the army in 1959 when he finished his O-levels. His mother said, totally not going to school before my grandma. She says, go to school. Uh, so my father goes to school, does his A-levels. And then there's a gap year between A-levels and university. So he gets a job with BP, British Petroleum, back then. The Olympios are running it. At the end of that one year, the BP makes him an offer. They give him a house, give him a car, make him regional manager. So my father goes back to his mom, his personal advisor. says, Mama, Dada, this is what they want to give me. Oh, what should I do? And then his mother, a little lady, says, you see that school on the hill where when they finish, they wear their choir robes. You go there. There's more time for making money. So my father went to Legon because of the advice of his mother. Fast forward to 1979. By then we were in China because he was now in the foreign affairs. Of course, Gigi Rollins comes in. Generals are executed and everything. Later on, my father was reflecting. He says his mother actually saved him from a possible fate like that because the people who were executed would have been his intake, most of them. Those would have been his age mates, late 30s. <laughs> wow. Yes. Uh, the iconography of what you describe, I will shift even from the sordid part mm -hmm. and stay with the iconography of what you describe. You are making a career decision. Here's a picture of a car, a house, yes. all the glamour, mm -hmm. everything that a mother should dream about. Yes. And you ask for advice, and she says, that place that when you go, you graduate and you wear a gown. Yes. You will go there. Yes. That is the vision she had for my father. Even going to Achimota school, my father never, nearly didn't go. Because when he passed the uh, Stan 7, um, there was no money. 
My grandfather said, there was no money. And in that conversation, there was a traditional priestess who was listening to my father come to tell his father that he wanted to go to school and there was no money. And she ran to the other village where my grandma was and went and told her that, listen, the boy has passed. The traditional priestess ran. She ran. Wasn't that a taboo? I don't even know. She fled. She had to go there quickly and before anything could happen. She said, listen, make sure you send this boy to school. So my great-grandparents, who were Charlotte farmers, onions, they sold these onions, they, they grew the onions, and then my grandma would sell the onions in Makola. And my, my mother was, my grandmother was, was impressed because every Saturday, the Achimota school people would come to Makola, and she just loved the Achimota sandals and the uniform. And she said, my child must go there. And so that's how my father ended up in Achimota school. Wow. Yes. And then ended up going to university and avoiding the military career. But he still had that military thing in him. He said they did a, a, a retreat once when he was uh, uh, one of the junior officers. He had a little platoon. They went camping. And then, you know, in the mornings, overnight, they stayed overnight away from school. There was inspection in the mornings. But overnight, it had rained, similarly to, similarly to today. It had rained. So the place was wet and muddy. But he woke his troop up and said, guys, forget the rain. We have to be ready for inspection. So when they came for inspection, only his company or his unit was ready. He said he got an immediate promotion to uh, regimental sergeant major. And that's how come he headed the, the cadets. And that's how come the army were thinking, this is officer material. Yes. But for the, gra the grandma had said, other plans. The, 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 the gown. Go, to, go and wear the gown. <laughs> Let's find out from you. What's the one biggest lesson you've learned on your professional journey? Many lessons, but the biggest one is excellence. And in the field that I'm, I'm in, creativity too is a, plays a big part. You want to be creative. I was, I was watching Anita's interview with you. I loved it. And she was talking about creativity and what new thing will I do that will surprise Albert? Because Albert knows I can do this and this, but what will I do to surprise? What will I, how do I surprise my audience? So, so excellence and creativity. Excellence is making sure that, and you said something about how you said uh, Pastor Otabo uh, always wants to make sure he delivers the best sermon possible because you do not know who is watching you for the very first time. Nobody must catch you on a bad day. I judge myself uh, based on my most recent event or my most recent show. So for me, if you tell me what's my favorite show right now, it's the one I ended today at 9 a.m. Mm. And I have to top it. And uh, so, 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 so that's the way I see things. Excellence, um, creativity. I'll give you an example. So in one of my shows, um, we had a dentist coming on, I knew from the show run. I made a mental note to take a tooth toothbrush onto the set to do my introduction with it, but I forgot. And I got on the set, I asked around for a toothbrush, there was no toothbrush, of course, nobody's gonna have a fresh toothbrush. And then I realized that ah, the dentist is setting up. I asked the dentist, Madam Tess, do you have a toothbrush for me? He says it's in her car, please give me a toothbrush. So they bring the toothbrush, and then at some point in the show, by way of promoting, coming next, up next is the segment with the dentist. I said, you know what? Years ago, I, I tried to make toothbrushing interesting or toothbrushing for my kids. So I wrote a poem on uh, the premise that what would you do if you found out that your toothbrush could speak to you? What do you think the toothbrush would say? And the whole poem was called My Friendly Toothbrush. And it's about a toothbrush who says, hey, my friend, uh, I'm on duty two, days a, uh, two times a day, 14 days a week, you know, and sometimes I feel like striking because I work so hard. If I'm tired, you lay me down so that I would have earned my rest. You know, I'm always on duty every time. So, and I just showed them how to brush your teeth. And I delivered that poem on the, on, on, on the, on the set. And they were just so freaked out. Uh, when um, Samuel, uh, our guy who won the bronze medal, won his, his, his thing. I came on. Boxing. Yes, yeah, boxed. I, I, when our, our relay team qualified for the final, I decided to start my show uh, like an athlete, you know, on your marks, get set, go. When we got Phobia on the set, I brought a ball on the set. And so we, the ladies in the stilettos, were, we were passing the ball around and juggling and keep it interesting because people want to be entertained. What do you want to achieve as a communicator? What do you want to achieve? The organization is key. I want to make sure that um, I make an impact so that the organization is better when I've exited. My father once told me that it's not important going in, it's the coming out. Never go anywhere 
without having an exit plan. So you want to always look to what happens at the end and make sure that it's better because of you. And if you were to describe this whole thing in one word, what word would it be? Legacy. I knew it. <laughs> I was expecting that word. It's like it had to be legacy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's I'm going to come back to you for a closing <laughs> thought. And uh, let me tell you my 10 big lessons from this conversation. And, I, and I, I, I must warn you that I could have done this all day long because it's just been so beautiful talking to you, Kafui Day. So my 10 takeaways, and for those of you watching us on TV, social media, and on various platforms, and also on radio, on Joy 99.7 FM, this is our tradition. In the engine room, we get 10 lessons and then we debate which one is your favorite and why. So first is from, first lesson from Kafi Day is about your hero and he says Larry King, right from the beginning to the end of his career, you thought he exuded excellence and he asked simple but very probing questions. Number two is about the power of words. He talked about the 10 word challenge you and your brothers had to go through. Yes. Number three is about education, make it more practical, co-create something exciting mm -hmm. with the beneficiaries. Number four is about research. You see, in the real world, copying it's allowed. is allowed. Big time. Number five is social skills. Treat people with respect and treat people, show an interest in people because they have a story to tell. Number six is the trying times edition. Cyberbullying. Always, always come. The fact that you will face yes. stories created by people mm -hmm. and you need to respond in the right way. Number mm -hmm. seven, my beautiful Ghana, I talked about domestic tourism. We must add value to our domestic tourism. Number eight is about parenting. You said we have them for just a short while. Let's give them our all now. Number nine is about excellence and creativity, your biggest lessons in your professional life. And the last one is legacy. One time. Leave every, everywhere you go yes, better, better than you met it. Indeed. Let's end on a somber note of mental health. I know you're an ambassador for mental health. Yes, indeed. Take us home with your thoughts about how we can make the world a better place just by paying attention to the mental health of people. People are going through a lot and the fact that you cannot see an injury, maybe a bandaged finger or a leg in a cast, doesn't mean that people are not hurting. Yeah, so sometimes just even asking, hey, how are you doing? And listening to the story. A lot of people, when you ask them, uh, how are you doing? And then they tell you a, a sad story. Then you, most people want to top that sad story with an even, oh, you don't know, you, don't, you think you are suffering. Uh, me, I've done, I'm, I'm suffering even more than you. And that's not the whole point. You just want to listen to people and uh, encourage them. Encourage them. Uh, Father Buckle, I call him Father Buckle, but I know he's Archbishop. He's a Father Buckle because from secondary school, he was my RE teacher and that's how we remember him. He said, sometimes when people are hurting, the best gift you can offer them is silence. Somebody has lost a, a parent, a loved one, or they're going through tough times. Don't come there and start proposing solutions. And uh, I'm guilty of that sometimes. You, as a man, you always want to, oh, let's fix it. Sometimes just keep quiet and listen. That's it. Just listen. Listen. It feels uncomfortable, but sometimes people, some people just want that. They just want you to just listen to listen, them, let them talk, you know, give a space for people to listen. And my wife said something once uh, when I wasn't so kind to her. She says, be kind. And that hasn't left me. Two words. Yes, be kind. <laughs> Good evening to you, or hello to you, Dr. Jifa <laughs> Day. We are we're celebrating you and your, and your amazing work that yeah. you do. Yeah. Coffee on a brighter note, talking about father. Mm -hmm. Um, Father Andrew Campbell yes. talked about one of the brightest moments in his recent interview on the same show, on the same series, talked about one of the brightest moments being, being with Akusia in Japan on yes. your show, yes. winning 25,000 Ghana cities for the lepers. Yes. And he says, that last question, Charlie, it was <laughs> tempting, but he knew that if he tempted it and he didn't get it, he would have come down to 2,000. So, I'm, Charlie, he grabbed you. the 25,000 and ran, and he yes. says he would never do it again. <laughs> he, he, he didn't want, he said, what am I doing on the game show? And we, we, our producer, Regina, uh, said, listen, you're doing this for the lepers. And that touched his chord. He said, well, I'll do this for the lepers. And he gave every single peso of the 25,000. He didn't give anything for himself. He says he enjoyed it, but he would never do it again. And you know what happened? Somebody came on the show later on, won 12,000, and said, 
I said, I asked her, what are you going to do with the money? She says, I'm going to give half of it to Father Campbell. Father Campbell. Because she was inspired by what he did for the lepers. And so she did that. I like this inspirational yes. myth on which you're ending this show. Thank you so much, Kafi, for coming. It's a real Let's, pleasure, Albert. Let's do it again. Yes. No, by God's grace. And I'll listen and you talk. I have always wanted to interview you. So who knows? We may flip the, flip the script on the last episode and I'll interview you. That would be beautiful. <laughs> so... On behalf of Team Springboard, led by Comfort, let me say a big thank you to every one of you for being part of this and for faithfully staying with us on the engine room. We are not done yet. There's so much more that is coming up on this platform. But a big thank you to MTN Pulse, UMB Bank, the Enterprise Group, the Multimedia Group, and the Graphic Business. On Tuesday, get the Graphic Business, the power of words. Read this article on Cafe from beginning to the end, and you will be blessed thereby. Till then, my name is Albert Okran saying God bless you, God bless you, and God bless you.